Part 1 You will hear a telephone conversation between a customer and a shop assistant. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Good morning, Jenny Suit Rental. Jenny speaking. How may I be of service? Hi there. My name is Max Jones. That's J-O-N-E-S. And I'm looking to rent a suit out for a special occasion. Certainly, Max. We charge a set fee for our services. You can either choose from our designer range and pay £50 to rent your suit out, or choose from our standard range at a cost of £25. So, what will it be? Oh, the first option, please, Jenny. Uh, £25, did you say? Unfortunately not. The designer range is twice that price. Oh, in that case, I'll take the second option. Uh, standard, was that it? That's right. Now, before we go any further, may I ask how you intend to pay? Do you accept cheques? Yes, but only in exceptional circumstances. We prefer cash or credit card. Well, as I haven't got one, does this count as uh, those circumstances? Yes, that'll be fine. Make it payable to Jenny's Suit Rental. Will do. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Now, Max, can I take your measurements, please, and a few details about what sort of suit you have in mind? Certainly. Let's start with the trousers, then, shall we? What is your waist size and leg length? I used to be 32 waist, you know, but these days it's more like 36. Too many cream pies. I've been there. And about the leg, 34? I wish... I'm afraid I'm somewhat lacking in the height department. Not even a 32. 30, I'm afraid. Never mind. As for the colour, could you do a dark grey suit? In fact, we have a very smart one of those in just your size. You're in luck. Now, what about shoes? Same colour? No, I think I prefer something darker. OK, let's go with traditional black then, shall we? What about size? Uh, I'm a size 45. Hmm... By my calculations, that's a uh, 10 in our sizes. And style? What have you got? We do suede, nubuck and traditional leather. Definitely the last one. Very well. And will you be wanting a necktie? Do you do bow ties? Of course. I'll put one of those down in your order. Dark grey, I presume? Perfect. To match the suit. I think I fancy a light blue shirt, by the way. Might I recommend a green? Green would go very well with the suit you are renting. Light or dark? I'd say dark. Dark it is then. My next size is 17 and a half. Uh, hard to believe that a little over a year ago I could fit into a 15, isn't it? Those cream pies again, right? You got it. Now, what about your suit jacket? Same colour as the trousers, obviously, but what size? Medium should be fine. You sure? Yeah. And have you got any of those three-button ones? I'm afraid not. The one- and two-button suit jackets are far more popular at the moment. In fact, the one button is all the rage. Let's have that one, then. No problem. Now. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear two students talking about a class assignment about wild bird rescue and rehabilitation. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. OK, let's go over the requirements and see what we have left to do. Let's see. We have to give the professor a written summary of the information we've gathered on our topic, wild bird rescue and rehabilitation. The other written thing we have to turn in is a case study of the rehabilitation of one bird. We have the information on that already. Right. All we have to do is write it up. What about charts and graphs? Do we need to include something like that? I don't think so. They aren't really relevant, but we do have to turn in a list of the resources we used. Naturally. What about videos? I heard some of the other students were doing that. Well, I guess that must be optional, because I don't see it on the requirements list. OK, we should start planning our class presentation since that counts for half the grade. We've looked at lots of sources of information, but I think our best source was the interviews we did with the wildlife rehabilitators. Agreed. That and the journal articles. I think we have enough information from those two sources for the presentation anyhow. The books we looked at weren't all that helpful. I wonder if we should try to bring in some live birds for the presentation. That would be too difficult, don't you think? But we have lots of photos of rehabilitated birds. We can show those. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Right. OK, I think we should start by talking about how to rescue a bird. Probably first we should help people understand which birds need rescuing. Yeah, that's really important. Because a lot of times people see a baby bird that's all alone, or they find a bird sitting on the ground and they think it needs to be rescued. And usually, those are just baby birds learning to fly. So we should emphasize that people should only attempt to rescue a bird that's clearly injured. For certain kinds of birds, the rescuer needs to wear protective gloves because some of those birds have sharp claws and can tear your shirt or worse, injure your face or some other part of your body. Yes, that's an important point. OK, next, let's tell people to put the injured bird in a box a box with good air circulation. We should let them know that a cage isn't necessary and a bag, especially a plastic one, could hurt the bird more. Another thing we need to say is that the best way to help the bird stay calm is not by petting it or talking to it, but by leaving it completely alone. Then people should take the bird to the bird rescue center as soon as possible. Right, and we should also point out that when they're driving the bird to the rescue center, it's better not to play music on the radio or talk loudly because those things just stress the bird. Yes, it's better just to speak quietly while you have the bird in the car. OK, we've got that part covered. Next, we should talk about what happens at the rescue center. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. Richard Murray, a zoologist and popular TV personality, has been giving a talk on endangered species of wildlife to members of the Young Conservationists Association in a small town in the south of England. Listen to the extract from the discussion he had with two of the young people after his talk. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. What would you say, Mr Murray, are the main reasons that so much of our wildlife will have died out by the end of the next few decades? Well, Tony, we can't of course rule out the effect of urbanisation due to the spread of population. But apart from that, I believe there are two reasons which in a way, are like the opposite ends of a piece of string. If you tie a knot in that piece of string, you end up with a circle, and whichever way you go round, it's going to turn out to be the same. I don't think I quite get that, Mr Murray. Well, let's put it another way. It's rather like a film. You've got the good guys and the bad guys. They're pulling in opposite directions, but when it comes to the final showdown... It's hard to make out which is which. What are your two reasons, Mr Murray? I call them greed and caring. Greed and caring? Yes, I know they don't seem to have much to do with one another, but think about it. The motive of greed is pretty obvious. In the course of the next few months, thousands of baby seals will be bludgeoned to death before they're even weaned from their mothers. What for? For the sale of their skins at inflated prices to please the vanity of a few and line the pockets of the killers. Crocodiles will be slaughtered to provide shoes and handbags for the rich. Gorillas, tigers, leopards and rhinos will be hunted for senseless sport or poached in defiance of regulations. Their skins, their horns and their magnificent heads will be used as trophies to decorate someone's living room floor or walls. That's terrible. Yes, but it's not all. The whale, probably the most impressive and certainly one of the most intelligent sea mammals in creation, will be cruelly hunted and harpooned to make more money for the profiteers. The dolphin, the sailor's friend, will be indiscriminately battered to death at so much ahead on the grounds that it is taking away the livelihood of a few fishermen by consuming the fish in its natural habitat. But surely, Mr Murray, we do have to keep warm. We need whale oil and ambergris. Fishermen have to make a living. Part of what you say is true, of course, Tony, but we shall have to enforce far stricter controls if future generations are not to find themselves in a world devoid of wildlife as we know it. Well, I see what you mean about fur coats and crocodile handbags, Mr Murray, but I don't understand what you mean by caring. That can't be bad, surely. I mean, I thought we were supposed to be living in a caring society. Well, so we do, in a way. The trouble is, there are so many well-intentioned people who start out with the best possible motives of trying to protect or immunise us from this, that or the other in the most effective way at the quickest possible rate. But in their enthusiasm, they lose sight of the long-term consequences. It's only very gradually that the danger to other forms of life, including humans, comes out not to say leaks out, and by that time it'll probably be too late to do much about it. Take insecticides, for instance. But insect... Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. But insecticides protect crops from pets. They destroy disease-carrying mites and creepy crawlies like cockroaches. True, but nature has a way of developing her own immunity against insecticides and other pest controls, with the result that the biologists are driven to inventing stronger and stronger compounds, which, though they may annihilate the pest, nevertheless permeate the environment, are assimilated by plant and animal life, and become absorbed by the soil. Countless innocent creatures, the beaver or the mole, for example, are performing a useful task in the natural control. The alarming prospect is that as these poisons enter the foods we eat, and consequently our own systems, they'll find their way into the body of the pregnant mother and into her milk, offering incalculable risks to the unborn or newly born infant. In spite of all our technological expertise, our time is running out. We're virtually destroying ourselves. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture given by a tour agent. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome to Hawaii Tour Agency. Let me tell you a little about a special package we have going on this week. I know everybody wants to get away from the stress of work and life, so I think you should all consider a week-long vacation to the paradise of Hawaii. First off, let me tell you all a little bit about Hawaii. The Hawaiian Islands are of volcanic origin and are edged with coral reefs. Because of its volcanic origins, people often go especially to see the volcanoes. Hawaii is the largest and geologically the youngest island of the group. Oahu is the most populous and economically important. The capital of Honolulu is located on the island of Oahu, the only U.S. state in the tropics. Hawaii is sometimes called the Paradise of the Pacific because of its spectacular beauty, abundant sunshine, Expanses of lush green plants and beautiful colored flowers, palm trees, coral beaches with rolling white surf, and cloud-covered volcanic peaks rising to majestic heights. Some of the world's largest active and inactive volcanoes are found on Hawaii and Maui. Eruptions of the active volcanoes have provided spectacular displays, but their lava flows have occasionally caused great property damage. The lava can spill down the mountains, into the settlements where people live. The most famous of these is right by Honolulu. It is called Diamond Head because from far away, the top of the volcano looks like a diamond. Vegetation is generally luxuriant throughout the islands, with giant fern forests and lush vegetation. Although many species of birds and domestic animals have been introduced on the islands, there are few wild animals other than boars and goats, and there are no snakes. The coastal waters abound with fish. More ethnic and cultural groups are represented in Hawaii than in any other state. Chinese laborers who came to work in the sugar industry 
were the first of the large groups of immigrants to arrive, starting in 1852, and Filipinos and Koreans were the last, after 1900. Other immigrant groups, including Portuguese, Germans, Japanese, and Puerto Ricans, came in the latter part of the 19th century. Intermarriage with other races has brought a further decrease in the number of pure-blooded Hawaiians who comprise a very small percentage of the population. Now all of this sounds very interesting, right? For only $600 per person, we are offering a tour package to Hawaii. This includes your round-trip airfare and fully guided tours. The duration of the trip is five days, including hotel for five nights and tour buses that will take you all around. We will go to the famous beaches, the volcanoes, and the forests. Sign up today to save your space, as seats are running out quickly. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.